In this video, we'll define Riemann sums and see how they can help us estimate the area underneath a general curve. Here's a graph of the function 1 over x. Let's try to find the area of the region underneath this curve, above the x-axis, and between the vertical lines x equals 1 and x equals 6. So we want to find the area of this shaded region right here. It's not a rectangle. It's not a trapezoid, it's not a triangle, it's not a sector of a circle, it's not some combination of those things. So we can't use basic geometry to find its area. But perhaps we can estimate that area somehow. Let's divide the x-axis between 1 and 6 into 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 equal pieces of length 1. And on each of these subintervals, of the interval from 1 to 6, let's build a rectangle. On the interval from 1 to 2, we'll use the right endpoint 2. We'll plug 2 into the function 1 over x. That gives us 1 half, so this rectangle has height 1 half and width 1, so its area is 1 half. Notice that the x scale and the y scale are different, so this length is 1, that length right there is 1 half. This rectangle has area 1 half. For the second rectangle, we'll use its right endpoint, so we plug 3 into the function 1 over x, and we get 1 third. This rectangle has an area of 1 third times 1. This one will have an area of 1 fourth times 1, area of 1 fifth times 1, area of 1 sixth times 1. So if we add up those five areas, we will get a number that's going to be a little bit less than the area of the region that we want. Let's compute that estimate. Our first rectangle had area 1 half, then area 1 third, then area 1 fourth, then area 1 fifth, and that was, and then finally area 1 sixth. One, two, three, four, five rectangle areas. That's fine. Uh, we could write it this way. We could add. Let's compute those areas. We could work this out by typing in 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth plus 1 fifth plus 1 sixth into a calculator or computer. We would get the answer would be 29 twentieths or 1.45. One so what we know is the area we're looking for has to be greater than, well, greater than equal to, but probably greater than 1.45. Now, as long as we only have five rectangles, this is not a difficult arithmetic expression to write down. But if we change the number of rectangles, then suddenly we're going to have to write more numbers down. For example, we might have to write 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth plus all the way up to 1 11th, and I'm getting tired of writing these things, so I'll write plus dot 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 plus 1 11th, and I could work out that sum. There might be a more compact way to write this. You may have seen this sigma notation. This is a Greek capital letter sigma, which stands for summa, which means sum in Greek. So if we could figure out a formula for these things we're adding up, it's 1 over an integer. So I could say I'm adding up the numbers of the form 1 over k, and I want k to start at 2, and I want it to go up to 11. So that means plug in 2, 1 half, plus plug in 3, 1 third, plus plug in 4, 1 fourth, plus, and keep going until you get to the last value, 11, and plug that in, 1 over 11. If we had a different function uh, than 1 over x, we might want to add up something like 1 over k squared, maybe, for the function 1 over x squared. And we might this, want this one to go from k equals 1 to 4. So we would plug in 1, 1 over 1 squared, plus 1 over 2 squared, plus 1 over 3 squared, plus 1 over 4 squared. Then we'd stop because the, the ending value here for k is 4 and then we could compute this sum. So this sigma notation is just a shorthand way of writing down 
a sum of many numbers. We call k the index for this sum, and it doesn't have to be k. We could write the sum from n equals 1 to 4 of 1 over n squared, and that would still be 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared plus 1 over 4 squared. We could write the same sum down in a different way. For example, if I write 1 over k plus 1, that sum from k equals 1 to 10, when I plug in 1, I get 1 over 2, then plus 1 over 3, plus 1 over 4, plus dot, dot, dot. And when I plug in 10, I get 1 over 11. So this sum is the same as that sum up there. We've just written it in a different way. These sums, using sigma notation, have various properties. If we add up a constant n times, we just get n times that constant. I take the sum of 1 over k plus 1 over k squared, where I put these in parentheses, and I let k equal 1 to 3, then one way to work this out would be the sum of 1 over 1 plus 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 3 squared. Another way to do this would be to write it as the sum of 1 over k from k equals 1 to 3 plus the sum from k equals 1 to 3 of 1 over k squared. In this way, we would have 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 from the first sum, plus 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared from the second sum. Both of these sums end up being the same thing because addition is commutative. There's a similar property for subtraction, and there's also what we call the constant multiple rule. If we multiply everything in our sum, we can factor that out of the sum. For example, if we have 5 times the quantity 1 plus 2 plus 3, that's the same thing as 5 times 1 plus 5 times 2 plus 5 times 3. In other words, 5 times the sum of k, with k going from 1 to 3, is the same thing as the sum of 5k, with k going from 1 to to 3. Coming back to our example of finding the area underneath the curve 1 over x, we've built these rectangles in a particular way where we've chosen the right endpoint of each interval, and that gives us a rectangle that's always below the graph of the function because the function is decreasing. And if we choose the right endpoint of each interval, we have the smallest function value on that interval. If instead we chose the left endpoint of each interval, then we'd have a rectangle with the top being above the graph of the function for every interval. So the sum of the areas of these blue rectangles should be bigger than the area we're looking for. That area is 1 plus 1 over 2 plus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 plus 1 over 5, which we could write as the sum of 1 over k with k going from 1 to 5. If I want to work out this sum, I could go to Wolfram Alpha or some computer or calculator and adjust the sum. So here we get 137 sixtieths or approximately 2.283. I could also just type in sum 1 over k from 1 to 5 and Wolfram Alpha will also give me the same answer there. So now I know the area I'm looking for has to be less than, or equal to perhaps, 2.283, and I already knew that it was greater than or equal to 1.45. We'd probably like a better estimate of that area, and we'll get to that, but at least we know the area we're looking for has to be bigger than 1.45 and less than 2.283. This sum of rectangle areas that we just computed is sometimes called an upper sum because the tops of the rectangles are always above the graph of the function. The one we computed previously is sometimes called a lower sum because the tops of the rectangles are always below the graph of the function. We got the lower sum from the right endpoints, we got the upper sum from the left endpoints, and that works in this case because this function is a decreasing function. 
If I change the function to an increasing function, now the right endpoints will give me an upper sum and the left endpoints will give me a lower sum. Back to our original example here, what if I pick some other point in each interval other than just the left endpoint or the right endpoint? If instead I choose the midpoint of each of these five intervals, so one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, and I compute the function heights at each of those points and use those heights for the heights of my rectangles, I can get these five rectangles, which I might call midpoint rectangles. Now if I find the sum of the areas of these five orange rectangles, then I'll get some number that is bigger than my lower sum, but smaller than my upper sum, so somewhere in between. And this area right here might be a better estimate of the area under the curve than my left endpoint or right endpoint sums. I could, in fact, for each of these intervals, choose some arbitrary point. Get a random number generator and choose a random number in each of these intervals and come up with a different set of rectangles and a different set of areas that might estimate the area of the region that we're actually looking for. In each of these cases, the midpoint sum, the upper sum, the lower sum, we have an example of what's called a Riemann sum. A Riemann sum is defined as something of this form. We split an interval into a bunch of pieces, each with width delta x. In our previous examples, all of our delta x's were one, but they could be a half each, or a third, or a fourth, or a tenth, or a one millionth. Or they don't even have to be the same size. On each of those pieces, we choose a point in each one of those little subintervals. We evaluate the function at that point, and we use that as the height of our rectangle and the delta x is the width of our rectangle. We add all those areas up and that becomes a Riemann sum. Although this definition of a Riemann sum is motivated by areas of rectangles, it's not defined in terms of area. In fact, we could come up with a Riemann sum even for a function that has negative values. And we'll do that eventually. What we do know is that any Riemann sum, for example, this midpoint sum, has to be between the upper sum and the lower sum for that function. If we look at the difference between the upper sum area and the lower sum area for each of these five pieces, we could stack all of these error rectangles on top of one another and notice that the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum is equal to the sum of these difference rectangles. And all of these fit into a single rectangle that is one unit wide and it extends from one-sixth the lowest height of the function on this interval, up to 1, so 5 sixth times 1. So what we know is that the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum is no more than 5 sixths. In general, we can say that if we have any Riemann sum at all, the difference between that Riemann sum and the actual area under the curve has to be no bigger than the difference between the upper sum and the lower sum, and that difference between the upper sum and the lower sum, if we do this same thing of sliding all these error rectangles over here, is no bigger than the difference in height between the in values of the function, assuming we have an increasing or a decreasing function, times the width of the widest rectangle in the partition, which we call the mesh of the partition. Now, if we can make this error piece smaller and smaller and smaller, that means that no matter which Riemann sum we compute, it should be getting closer and closer to the actual area we want. And for an increasing function or a decreasing function, we can do that by making the mesh smaller and smaller and smaller. That would mean making these rectangle widths, or delta x, which in this case is 1, making that smaller. And we'll take up that process next time.